All right, let's okay. get let's get our first guest on here. We're very excited to have Ian Burkhart joining us via Skype. Uh, Ian is a quadriplegic. Uh, Ian, it's great to see you. Joining us uh, with Ian uh, Gaurav Sharma, who is a principal research scientist at Battelle Memorial Instru in Institute. Hi. Gaurav, thank you for joining us. You're the nonprofit that developed the computer system. And from Ohio State Center for Neuromodulation, the doctor actually implanted the chip, Dr. Ali Rezai. Dr. Rezai, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great to have you. So, uh, Ian, you're a bionic man. I guess so. <laughs> How is that? Tell us about it. Um, well, I was lucky enough to be involved in this research study. The, the principle behind it is to regain use of my hands that I lost after I had a spinal cord injury almost six years ago. Now, how did you get involved in that study? Because that would be something that wouldn't happen to everybody. How did that happen? That's a great question. I was doing some rehab at Ohio State, um, working with some of their doctors and therapists. And I had mentioned to them that I was interested in what kind of research was going on in the field because I knew ever since my accident that, hey, I got hurt at the right time because of how science and technology are progressing there'd be something that would come along throughout my life that would really benefit my quality of life. So I made those interests known and kind of was in the right place at the right time. It's still a brave thing to do. Uh, did they talk to you about the risks involved? There's certainly quite a few risks involved with any surgery, let alone a brain surgery. Um, this was something where at that point I hadn't used my arm for or my hand for about three and a half years and I was kind of willing to try anything and even knowing that it's something that I won't ever really be able to use outside of the clinical setting in the, in the lab, just knowing that I'm able to help push that ball forward and help a lot of other people. And is that the big benefit for you? Because I remember reading something saying that your dad was not thrilled about you doing that, both because of the brain surgery that you'd have to have, but he also said that you weren't going to get anything out of it on a long-term basis. But you're basically saying that you do. You did. Certainly. I had to convince my family that this was something I wanted to do and was the right thing to do because they said, hold on, Ian, pump the brakes. You know, you just had this crazy injury a few years ago that changed your life forever, and now you want to kind of risk a lot of things in order to maybe progress that for something that you're not really going to be able to benefit from yourself. But I felt like I was in the right place at the right time and kind of my obligation to society to help, you know, push this type of research forward. Well, thank you for doing that, Ian. And, it, and I, it, I think it must be cool to be involved in this. I mean, how exciting. Dr. Rezai, you're the surgeon. Had you ever done anything like this before? Uh, we, we do surgeries of this type uh, for brain implants that we do for Parkinson's and other conditions routinely. But uh, this is the first time where we put a, uh, a microchip in the brain, uh, a small, the size of a small eraser head, um, that is allowing to record the brain signals from Ian's thoughts and uh, linking them towards wow. uh, his movements within milliseconds. How, do you connect the nerve endings to the chip? How is the chip connected to his brain and to then to the rest of his body? So um, the, the chip is a, a very small implant that goes in an area of the brain called the motor cortex. Uh, it, the cerebral cortex that is an area involved in planning, control, and execution of voluntary movements. For example, moving the uh, hands, arms, etc. And uh, we targeted this area using uh, brain imaging, functional MRI, that allows you to map uh, this motor cortex. And specifically in Ian's case, we needed to map the hand area. So uh, we had a small opening in the skull and we implanted this microchip in the area uh, the Look at that. Area You're playing that Guitar controls. Hero. That's awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. Exactly. Wow. Uh, do the neurons attach immediately? Does it take a while for them to accept the chip? How does that work? The, the neurons are actively uh, firing all the time. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the language of the brain is electricity. So the neurons were able to record the activity of the brain uh, and uh, make sense of it and interpret the brain signals, and then they're linked with the wired system from his brain to the uh, an external wearable sleeve garment that's developed by colleagues from Battelle. So that garment, you can see it on his right arm there, that's activating muscles in his arm? That's exactly right. So it's linking his thoughts um, and the intention to movements, uh, and it's understanding wow. them very quickly, uh, linking them to uh, the movements of his arm muscles. 
Ian, what does it feel like when, when you think something and your hand does something? It's a very strange feeling because when I had my spinal cord injury, I lost all sensation in my arm. So I can't feel when I'm actually picking up anything. I have to really rely on my sight um, to know that I'm actually picking something up. But just knowing that I can think for my hand to do something less than half of a second later, my hand will actually move and make that task something that I can do is incredible. But it's not something you ever had to think about before. So what what's that thought press process of grasp my hand? Yeah. Do you say hand move? You know, do you just... You know, I feel like it would be like trying to have telekinesis and make a door right. open, open, right. open, open, and it doesn't. But how, how do you do that? Yeah, it's certainly an interesting thing. The first, you know, 19, 20 years of my life, I took it all for granted. As, you know, you want your hand to open, you just think about your hand opening and it happens. But this is something that I was able to work with the therapists and the doctors um, and the researchers. And we would show a virtual hand on the screen and I would think about certain movements or they would actually put their own arm next to mine, and I would think about those same movements um, to try and learn. And then just after, you know, the last two and a half years of working, it's gotten a lot easier to now where it's something where I don't have to think about it as hard. But originally, it was something I had to really concentrate on. Wow. Gaurav Sharma is also here. He's this pre principal research scientist at the Patel Memorial Institute, where the the computer system was uh, created. Um, so, Guarav, how do you program a computer to understand brain signals? Well, we have to do a lot of training. Uh, so, as Ian mentioned, we, we show him a virtual hand on the screen in front of him, and then we ask him to imagine those movements that are being shown to him. When he's imagining those movements, uh, and the chip is recording the neural signal from his brain, they go to a computer where we have these machine learning-based algorithms. So those algorithms, based on the cue that we are presenting, we are trying to decode what he's thinking about. And that's an iterative process. We go through many blocks of training. So we are training our algorithms to learn or figure out what Ian is thinking. At the same time, Ian is also learning how to use the technology. So at some point, they both meet. And that's when we are able to decode his intent and once we decode that intent, we route those signals back to that garment or the sleeve on his arm and stimulate the right muscle to evoke that particular movement that Ian is thinking about. Wow. So the training kind of goes back and forth yes, between Ian and Yes, it's an iterative process. It goes in blocks. Uh, we start and then we go a few blocks uh, and then we see how well our algorithms are able to decode Ian's intent. And once we feel confident that it, yes, it's a robust uh, decoder, we lock it in, and then Ian goes with it. It's AI, really, because it, it's a learning it machine. Is. Yeah, it right. has to learn what signals correspond to what movements. It knows Absolutely. nothing when you start? Yep, there's zero. It starts wow. from, from scratch. And yeah. slowly it builds up, and it learns uh, fairly quickly, I have to say. Um, so that's the decoder output you just saw. Um, and it, it just basically, it's machine learning, so it's learning as we go. Right. Ian, was it many, many hours of training? Was it frustrating? Was it fun? Both frustrating and fun. It yeah. was something, you know, that no one has ever done. I've never done before. And it was a good challenge. You know, we do more and more training blocks. And you can see the decoder getting better and better as I'm learning and the computer are learning both together. It's really exciting to see that they can even figure out what I'm trying to think about and knowing that I'm thinking about the right things for them to figure it out. And is there kind of a, a delay there to make, like, you think it and then your hand moves? Does it happen almost as quickly as it used to? It's certainly not as quickly as it used to because before it was something that was almost an unconscious thought. Right. Um, now it's something I have to concentrate on, but the response time is less than half of a second. As you guys can see, it's quick enough of a response time to actually play Guitar Hero. That's, That's got to be pretty quick. That, is, <laughs> that has to be the pinnacle of accomplishment I would in this it. whole thing is playing guitar. That's amazing that you can do it. Gaurav, are we going to see um, more of this? Is this just the, be it seems like this is, must be the beginning of this kind of research. Absolutely. It, it is the beginning. Uh, we are very excited about what we have done as a team, Patel and OSU with Ian, but I mean, we need to move it forward. Um, our goal for the next uh, several years is to make the system portable, wearable, so that 
someone, a patient like Ian or someone else who has an injury can take it home with them. Uh, this is just the beginning, as you said. Uh, we are working on shrinking down the whole hardware part so that it can be, again, as I said, belt, worn, or a wearable device, as well as we are uh, working on to improve our machine learning algorithms. We want to make them robust so that we can minimize the amount of training that is required to do a simple task. I'm gathering, Dr. Rezai, from the name of your center, the Ohio State Center for Neuromodulation, that this is exactly the kind of work that you wanted to do at the center. Exactly. I mean, our goal is to um, hopefully there'll be a day uh, sometime soon where we can help many patients with physical disabilities to be more independent and function, have a better quality of life. And right now, Ian has a spinal cord injury that basically uh, severs his spinal cords uh, from the rest of the brain. So the brain signals are not going to the spinal cord and going to the nerves to move his hand. Then he's able to think and move his hands. We're also hopeful we can apply this in patients who have had strokes or other brain injuries. Yeah. So um, the goal is to restore quality of life and uh, improve the potential of functioning. And uh, one of the key areas is to accelerate the pace of worldwide research and collaborations to accelerate uh, the application of this technology and take it home instead of right now it has to be done in the laboratory. Right. But the goal is to have it done at home and miniaturized it so patients can use it at home. How close are we to that? Um, I'm hoping uh, sooner than later, I, I would say hopefully within uh, 10, 10 years, we can have this yeah. technology available at home for patients um, to be used and to be able to move their hands. Ian, two years ago, when we first uh, were testing this, he just had uh, movements opening and closing of his hands, and now he's able to do very sophisticated movements, playing Guitar Hero, taking a credit card, holding a cup of coffee, and have individual movements of his fingers. So this technology has tremendous potential for helping patients with physical disabilities. Ian, it must be very gratifying for you to be able to, to do this, to, to kind of contribute to this research. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure it's fun too, must, be, must feel pretty good. It certainly is. I feel lucky to be a part of it. Yeah. And just knowing that I'm helping a lot of other people and potentially helping myself if we can get everything working soon enough. Isn't that great? I hope so. Ian Burkhart. Gaurav Sharma, Dr. Ali Razai, thank you so much for joining us uh, today on the show to show us uh, what amazing things you're doing uh, in surgery, in the, in the computer labs, and, uh, and uh, Ian, what you're doing uh, using your body to help advance this uh, subject. It's really great. It's really great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you all later. Take care. Isn't that amazing? A virtual spinal cord. Yeah. Spinal cord well, bypass. And we're going to do VR in a bit, but of course yeah. the goal... Uh, I mean, it's more than just, I mean, this is, of course, the most immediate and most valuable stuff. Mm -hmm. But at some point, getting this idea of, of uh, somehow integrating hardware and human bioware is an intriguing thing. I mean, uh, you're going to see all the gear you have to put on to do the virtual reality. Oh. Wouldn't it be yeah. nice if you could just plug it right in? And I don't know if that would be nice. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for you. That sounds like something you would I'm love. I'm planning on it. I don't I, know. We'll I see. Not so much. I hope it happens we'll see. soon.